So welcome to episode 19 of the Lessons in Leadership podcast. Uh, my guest today is uh, the amazing Bill Manning. Bill, thank you for having me. I really appreciate being here today at the facility. Yeah, no, great to great to have you. The uh, the amazing part that's uh, <laughs> <laughs> we start off so know great about this that, year, <laughs> but uh, the only amazing is the amazing Spider Man. Well, well, I'll tell I'll you from my one. perspective, I'll define amazing. We met in Guelph, Ontario, yeah. at an Argos training camp years ago. Um, and just stayed in touch over LinkedIn yeah. and you've always been really gracious with your time and I appreciate it. And, and the ability to make time for me today is Absolutely. again, this podcast is all about people who've gone through the journey that, yep. that you've progressed through that may be at different stages yeah. and just providing some tips and lessons and stories that kind of will relate with them that they can empathize with yeah. Yeah. and realize they keep pushing through to that next destination and to do it the right way. So thank you for doing this. I appreciate that. Sure. Um, for those of you who don't know Bill, and I don't know how many of you wouldn't, um, if you're a sports fan, but Bill's background started, and it's probably previous to this. I just went through your LinkedIn profile. Um, back in the early days of the USL, uh, with three franchises as the president and GM, yeah. and then on to uh, Major League Soccer at the time with the Tampa Bay Mutiny. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a pivot that we'll talk about after that with the Houston Rockets as director of corporate partnerships. And then on to the Philadelphia Eagles as a Dallas Cowboys fan. We're just going to let that one slide right now uh, as VP of sales and service. And then on to president and GM again, back in major league soccer with Real Salt Lake. Yep. And now with Toronto FC and the Toronto Argonauts as a president role. So yeah, I can't let you go with the Cowboys. Yeah, I know. I mean, really? The, right. The second, second favorite team in Philadelphia is whoever's playing the Cowboys. Uh, <laughs> so you'd have an appetite for the Bills at least a little bit. Yeah, I've learned to... I've learned to lean to the Bills lately, uh, just because they're closer. So to get one of one of our ex Eagles, Sean McDermott, was uh, he was secondary coach when I was at the Eagles, head coach oh, at wow. uh, his brother Tim McDermott's president of Philadelphia Union. Small work, world, work, work, work with me world? at the Eagles. Yeah, wow. yeah, I know Sean really well. National champion wrestler. If you don't know really? that about Sean? Yeah, he was a, a prep national school wrestler. Awesome, awesome guy. Great wow. guy. Really. Not surprised at all by his success. Really, eh? Yeah. Well, maybe we'll get into that in one of the examples of people you've crossed yeah. paths with along yeah. the way. What did I miss prior to that or during any of that that you'd like to mention was part of your leadership path? Oh, uh, so, uh, <laughs> so when I was still a player, I had, uh, you know, back in the day, we didn't, we didn't make a lot of money and you still needed to find other sources of income. And so there was a an indoor soccer league that was starting up in California called the California, uh, California continental indoor soccer league. And I had applied and, you know, I had a degree, um, in marketing and I was a soccer player and I thought I could, you know, that would be cool for me to get involved in this startup indoor soccer league. And I wound up actually getting a job there. So I moved to California with my wife. Uh, we just got married at the time. And I found a USL team to play for out there called the Valley Golden Eagles. Um, and then after about seven months, I was 27 at the time, 28, the commissioner came to me and he said, look, I have a question for you. And he said, do you want to be a soccer player or a soccer executive? And I said, I'd, I'd like to be a soccer player. And he said, wrong answer. <laughs> and so he, uh, cause you know, I was away on weekends playing and, and you know, you need to be all in and these jobs, you need to be all in. Mm -hmm. And what I realized is, is, you know, he basically said, look, <laughs> I can't keep you. Um, and I wound up actually going back to New York. I played for a team called the New York Fever. And for an extra thousand bucks a month, they let me come in the front office and gain some experience because I had had some experience with the Indoor Soccer League. And what I learned, though, is from that first experience with the Indoor Soccer League, you have to be all in. Like, I wasn't all in. I, w I wanted to play. And this was a source of income where I could make some money and learn the business because I really did want to work in sports one day. And Ronnie Weinstein was the commissioner, and we we reconnected after years, and and he was he was really proud of the path that I took, and I was proud of him for in that moment handling me with kids' gloves. Uh, but I still wanted to play. Um, but I learned that to be in this business on the executive front, you have to be all in. Yeah, it 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 is it becomes twenty four seven. My family, like you, yeah, everyone's involved. It's you yeah. gotta be all in. Interesting. So it's so that did, was the little piece that I. How did I, you let go? How did, how did you let go? Because um, I would imagine emotionally, even though you're you're now into an executive role, you're still kind of. No, those days are way done. long gone. Yeah. <laughs> no, I. It actually was uh, fortuitous. I. Um, I was thirty, 
uh, going on 31, and it was the off season of the 1995 season, and MLS was starting in 96. So I knew I was never going to play in, in MLS at that stage. And for the first time in my career, I lost my starting job. Um, and I got a phone call from uh, a guy by the name of Lou Edera, who was the president and owner of, of a team called the Long Island Rough Riders, who are still around to this day. They, they play in the USL kind of in the second tier. Um, and I was from Long Island. And just this working in the office, me and two other guys did it while we were still players. Yeah, right. We would come in and... Um, I would sell group sales and some little sponsorships. And while you're on the roster. Upper, while you're on the roster. And it, <laughs> I mean, the days are, yeah. but I took it really serious. I'd come in with a tie and yeah. I, I really took it serious. And um, I guess he had heard that I was working and helping out with the fever and we had some decent crowds. And um, he asked me if I wanted to be the general manager of Long Island Rough Riders. And uh, he said, and I mean like working though, not playing. Yeah, and, that was uh, the transition. <laughs> and uh, it was time. It was ready. I was ready to to hang up the boots and take that next step. And and uh, it was great. I mean, that really started my career. I had a chance to um, uh, get off to a successful start. Uh, our coach was a guy named Alfonso Mondello who works at MLS. So I've a guy I've known for many, many years. Um, and it was... Uh, it, it was perfect timing. So that, that so, kind of really, the Long Island Rough Riders is really where my career started. That was the pivot. Yeah. So you've worked in different leagues, in different roles. There's progression there. Um, how are you successful in getting to where you're at today? Like, how did you make all those little jumps? Could you, could you define what was in either your work, ethic, work mm -hmm. ethic, your desire, where you wanted to go to get to that next stage all the way along? Well, I think you, gotta, you have to know where you want to go. Right. Like uh, if you don't know where you're going, all roads lead there. And <laughs> you I always knew where I wanted to go. And you know, it's so crazy when I was when I was younger, um, Dave Checkett, who I've, I eventually wound up working for, was the CEO of the Rangers and Knicks, Madison Square Garden. And I was like, wow, that would be a cool job to have one day, you know, and. I admired like the general managers of, of baseball teams and, and, you know, cause soccer wasn't as prevalent when I was, when I was younger and basketball teams. And, um, I was like, you know, I can see myself having a future in these sports. And so I visualized being a team president one day, being a general manager one day. And, you know, the pivot for me was I became a soccer guy. I played, I was a general manager at a young age. Um, and back then you did do work on sponsorships and ticket sales and stuff. But, um, what I realized is I needed way more business experience. And so I was like, how can I, um, transition into not just being a soccer guy and being a sports executive, um, who really has a good pedigree in the sport of soccer. Um, and that's what transitioned me to go work in the NBA with the Houston Rockets for a guy named Tad Brown. And then, um, eventually for the Eagles. And, and I got another story, um, and just different people that have crossed my paths. Um, so when I was working in MLS for, for Tampa Bay, a good friend of mine was the president of the Vikings, a guy named Mike Kelly. And I told Mike that I was really interested in working in the NFL and he had connected me with Roger Goodell. And at that point, Roger Goodell was still the COO. And so it was maybe summer of 2001, a fall of 2001. And uh, Roger had lunch with me uh, in oh, his wow. office. And it was actually, I remember it was an off day. They'd given one, it was a Friday. And the one thing I remember him as I was giving some examples of some guys who had gone from soccer into football, Jamie Roots and he said to me, he said, look, you know, you, you brought up a couple of people who've made the transition. Len Komorowski was another one. He'd, he'd gone, he was indoor soccer and went to the NFL. And he said, but, you know, don't worry so much about everyone else's path. Make your own path. And he goes, make Bill Manning's path. And I was like, it just stuck with me forever. And it's funny because when I went to work for the Eagles, I had had a chance to see Roger and I reminded him of that. And he goes, oh, no, absolutely. I was really happy to see you take this role. And I remember our lunch. So it was really cool. And, and oh. just those words of wisdom, um, I've always resonated with me 
make your own path. You know, there really is no correct path. It's make your own path. And so for me, it was always visualizing where I wanted to go and then figuring out how to get there. And, you know, sometimes you have to knock on doors and, you know, you have to, timing is important, right? You know, so, so when there is like here at MLSE in Toronto SC, they were looking for a president. So the timing was right. And then there's some connections were made and, you know, so I was, uh, I, I, I've always been someone that can visualize where I want to go and then it's okay. What's the plan? How do we get there? Knowing that, you know, sometimes you hit roadblocks. Yeah. And there will be them during there your career. Be, not always, to get frustrated. always. It's interesting. You said a couple of things there that, that have, I can already tie back to past guests like Richard Petty, who yeah. I'm sure, you know, uh, when I was here, he was the CEO of Maple Leaf yeah. Sports Entertainment. Yeah. And I had him on the podcast after he, re he retired and I'd been gone from MLSC since Oh boy, 09, I think it was here 04 to 09. And Richard said that he wrote in his journal in university that he wanted to be the general manager or the owner or president of a basketball club in the NBA because yeah. he always loved basketball. Yeah. And, and things fell into place for yep. him. And, and Larry came along and they yeah. met and he got this opportunity. But he's like, he wrote it down. He visualized yeah. it. He said, here's where I wanted to go. And then started to follow that yeah, path. It's, That's it's funny you say that. So a friend of mine, for whatever reason, had a news clip that I had done when I was still playing with the New York Fever and they were talking to me about my career and what I wanted to do after my career. And I said, I want to be uh, a general manager and, and an executive in the sport one day and make my impact on the sport. And that was, I was, you know, 29 years old at the time or so. And it's funny. It's, it's, I, I get that. You have to visualize where you want to go and know where you want to go. And look, sometimes you change where you want to go. Um, you know, over time I've been 30 years in the business now and, you know, my, my goals and ambitions now are different than when I was 35. Right. And so those life you, changes, along life, the way, life right? changes. Right. And so, uh, but you gotta know where you want to go. Yeah. And, and then the second part that I really pulled out was you mentioned Roger Goodell finding the yeah. time for you yeah. have a lunch and yeah. remembering that and him remembering that. Yeah. You know, I yeah. look at some of the greatest leaders that I've been lucky enough to work around they found that time for others, yeah. right? And so yeah. it's important that you do that as you progress as a leader. Remember that people are going. Oh, through it that. is. And I, I even today, I met a young man from Ivy School of Business, and uh, I, I, I really, you know, there's a lot of young college kids and so on that will reach out, and I always try to take the time because I do remember the people in my life who have helped open doors and have helped given advice and. And I'm kind of like, who am I not to respond to an email, or who am I not to? take 15 minutes and have a cup of coffee with a kid. And, and so I really, um, I like this kid today. <laughs> He's someone, you know, I could see working here at MLSE and you just, you never know sometimes. And, and I just, you know, I think one thing that's lost on everyone, um, is sometimes it's okay to just be nice. And, <laughs> and I, uh, right? I try to, especially today, I try to, you know, every day I try to go about my life just being a good person and, 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 being nice. And, uh, so that's, sometimes you have to get hard and sometimes you got to get strong in different situations, but, um, it's okay to be nice. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I find leaders who are afraid to be that sometimes struggle because being tough and directive will only last so long, yeah. but a, a leader can be too nice and not learn any edge. No, you have, you have to right? have an edge and you have to get after it. Um, you have to have standards. Um, but, there's a way of doing things where, you know, and you're an athlete and sometimes you think back to your best coaches and sometimes they were the guys that were a little bit hard, but they had a good heart yep. and you wanted to, you wanted to, to go through a for wall them. for them. Yep. And, and, you know, one of the things is, is in this business, you got to create a brotherhood. You have to create, um, alignment, I call it and collaboration where everyone feels part of it. And so whether you're the equipment manager or the dishwasher or the sponsorship sales guy, or, you know, one of the physical therapists, you are part of that team winning on the field, you know, yeah, no matter what. It's interesting. We had, uh, when I was winning and losing both, both, both sides of the yeah, coin, right? Yeah. When I was here at MLSE, uh, Paul Maurice, who's the coach of the Florida Panthers right now, he was with the Toronto Marlies before he, he had been with the Carolina hurricanes, came into the organization with the Marlies, eventually got promoted to the Leafs. And what you just said about rallying everybody and getting everybody aligned, he would stop at Rico Coliseum when he was the AHL head coach 
shoot the sugar with me, grab the building operator and say, you know, here's the ice. It's kind of soft. What can you guys do about this? And the, and everybody felt like they were involved in that. Yeah. And that leadership skill gets everybody performing at their top 100%. level because they know their purpose and where yeah. it fits. Um, I did want to shift. I, I, I heard something in there and it's one of the questions I wanted to ask you anyways. Yeah. Talk to me about any personal influences in your life and your leadership style. So who has personally influenced who you are as a leader and does it show up in the way you lead professionally? Yeah, um, I had mentioned Dave Checkett. Um, Dave was the owner of Real Salt Lake when I went to work there. Um, and he was just such a great example of a man who was a genuinely good human being um, and who was someone that you wanted to follow and you wanted to do good things for. Um, and he, he was a visionary, like, like he, he, he knew like where we wanted to Real Salt Lake to go. And even when you were like, oh, we can't, we can't sell out every game. Like his vision was, we're going to sell out every game and how we get there. But he did it in such a genuine way, such a good way. And I always admired that because, um, he held high standards, but it didn't go at the expense of him being a good man. And, and good to his people that worked for him. And, right. you know, there was three of us that, that, you know, the president, the GM and the head coach that, you know, Dave worked closely with. And I think all three of us would go through a wall for that guy. So he, he had a big influence on me. Um, you know, probably the biggest, you know, in my career of, of anyone that I've worked for. And I've worked for some really good people. I've mm -hmm. been very, knock on wood, really fortunate to have worked for some good people. Um, but Dave was someone that, uh, I, I really have great admiration for great family man. Yeah. Really good man. When I, when I look at my, uh, my DNA, it took me a while to mature a little bit and someone argue I'm still on that path <laughs> at 51, but, um, and one of the things, right? yeah, yeah. It, 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 but it struck me when my dad passed away. So I've lost both my parents and a brother, unfortunately, um, that, Part of my leadership style that, you know, people used to, you know, like working around and perform around and that I never leaned into until I learned the lesson when dad passed was that part of my leadership style was my mom and dad. Mm. My mom mm -hmm. was maritime. We we're all maritimers originally, but my mom was that Nova Scotia, everybody be happy, make sure food's on the table. Yep. She'll rest when everybody else is yeah, smiling. Yeah. And my dad was a military guy for 25 yep. years. So he was, he was disciplined and a process mm -hmm. and, and expectations. Um, and so I look at that, I'm like, that's kind of my DNA. Um, do you have any personal friends, family where you kind of could look at it and go, oh, geez, you know what? That person influenced me in my life and it shows up and they didn't have anything to do with my yeah. professional growth. Um, you know, you mentioned your parents, you know, I'm fortunate my mom and dad are still, still with me. And, and my dad was someone when I was young and I was a player, I actually went to work for my dad. My dad was NYPD. And like a lot of policemen, he retired and got into the security business and him and an, uh, an old, um, you know, um, an old partner of his started this security business and I was able to do some work with them while I was still playing. Um, but I remember my dad was like the hardest working guy I ever knew and ever met. And whether he was on the police force, I remember when I was very, very young, my mom just reminded me, I saw them last week. My dad drove a Wonder Bread truck while he was still a policeman just wow. to put food on the table. And, um, you know, it's, it's, he was, and then when I had an opportunity to see when he transitioned out of being a police officer into the security business, how much he put into it. And he wound up doing well and eventually sold the company and, and um, his work ethic was unbelievable. And so one of the things that as I got into the business is, you know, if, if you don't put a lot into it, you're not going to get a lot out. And, you know, this is a, this is a hardworking, tough business. And, you know, again, I use the word all in is kind of one of my talking points. Like when it's hard and when, you know, when, when things, sometimes you just got to grind it out and yep. you got to be in like one example, like this year, we came from training camp and we got in at seven o'clock in the morning and uh, I went home, I took a shower and I came in and we were all off. This was a Sunday and John Herdman was here. And so me and John Herdman worked all day long 
Um, and then again, the next day was, I think it was family day. It was a big you know, a holiday and a few other people came in and John was here and I was here and, and, you know, we came off a year where we were in last place, dead last place and the soccer side and the Argos, thank God had a great season. Um, but sometimes you just got to work and you got to push through the bad times to get back to the good times. And my dad taught me that, you know, I remember my dad is definitely not a trophy for everyone type guy. Yep. And I remember when I was very young, I was in a, in a school race and I think I came in like fourth or fifth place. And, uh, he's like, and I was kind of smiling and joking around. He's like, what are you smiling for? And I was like, I was like, Oh, you know, I did pretty good. And he's like, no, in fourth place. <laughs> like you didn't get a trophy and all that. And it was jarring. But I, I actually was like, you know, yeah, I want to win. And, and so my dad was tough that way, but very caring, but hardworking. And, and uh, that's something that, um, you know, I've tried at different points in my career. You just, you got to get after it and you got to work. Yeah, and there's ups and downs. There you is do ups have and downs. Time and you, and yeah. you do have to settle down a little bit because you can't yes. stay at that no. speed no, all you the can't. time. No, you can't. And, and, and I can... I can support that uh, John Herdman story as well. You know, yeah. I, I was lucky to do some work with Canada Soccer last year, um, and John had gotten back from the World Cup. He was in Toronto doing player evaluations, but he found the time to catch up with me over lunch at the West End to find out what I was doing as a consultant in the organization to help them progress. Yeah. So it can get to the standards he expected, all in. Yeah. And and he yeah. saw every opportunity to say, "Hold on, here's maybe a guy who can influence a change that we need and yeah. and be part of that change." So. Yeah, work ethic's a big, big part of this yeah, role in this industry. Yeah, you know, when I, you know, and I've changed because I used to be more of a late night and I would do a lot of work at 12, 1 o'clock in the morning while I was home and um, come in a bit later. And now I've kind of changed my routine up and, and in part because he, <laughs> because of this guy too. So um, it's, uh, it, it's part of it. But my dad was a really hard worker. Got it. So that's a big, big part yeah. of your DNA. It sets the right example as well. Um, on that note, when I opened up BMO Field here as the general manager, um, I had my worst leadership display ever one day while we we're opening up the stadium. And it was a long day, 14 hours. And my process at the beginning of the day was to sit with the building manager and the events manager and say, you know, where are we at? What are you working on? And, and where do I help you with any gaps and empowerment and whatever it looks like? Where do you be enabled, get answers, et cetera. And and then at the end of the day, we'd go through those checklists. And we were getting closer and closer to opening and, and bolts were falling from the sky and the stands and things that weren't supposed to happen were happening. And, and I was starting to fold under the pressure and, and I brought them in. I said, well, you guys just go home and get some sleep because you didn't accomplish anything today. So maybe tomorrow you'll do something. And they left and Bill, these people had been working their butts off. Not for me, for themselves, for their pride, mm -hmm. for the team. Um, and I felt terrible when they left. And the turning point was they came in and I apologized to all of them the next morning. And I said, guys, I let you down. I, had a I said, it's like not going to help. Yep. And, and where I'm going with that is I learned from that failure that I maybe wouldn't have done that five years before. I would have held my breath and yeah. no, I've got to show edge and I've got to, um, and I carried that forward more proactively in future career stops to mm -hmm. say, whoa, whoa, self-awareness here. You're getting there. Yep. Stop, breathe. Um, is there a failure or maybe not a failure, a learning lesson that kind of you took forward that you could share with the group? I, I have a moment just like that. There was a, a young lady named Katie Mattis, who to this day is, um, you know, a good friend. And, and, you know, I have great admiration for her. She went to work with me at Real Salt Lake. Uh, but we were working for a team at the time called the Minnesota Thunder. They're now, if you look at the lineage, they're now the Minnesota United and MLS. This was in the USL. And Katie was a young um, college graduate who had joined us. And I remember she had come to me with something and I, I kind of answered back very abruptly and I was like, just get it done and this, whatever. Um, and it was poor, it was poor form of me. And she was upset and I thought about it again over the weekend and I said, you know what? She was working her butt off and, you know, that was just been, I felt terrible about it. And so when we came in, she was already there. We had a small office and I could feel the tension. Um, and so I, I called her in and uh, 
I apologize. And from that moment on, she has been so loyal and with me in my corner. And she's the type, she sometimes tells me what I don't want to hear, but I need to hear. And in that moment, also recognizing. So you had a moment just like I did. And um, that was a moment for me that had I not recognized that, she probably would have left at some point. And she was, she's been very successful. She's had, had a great career. Um, and I wouldn't have benefited from that because when she was with me in Salt Lake, we went from being a lower than average team in commercial business to, uh, you know, a top five team by the time I left and she was, she, you know, so that's a, that's a story right there. I had this very, very similar experience and, you know, I had the wherewithal to apologize. Yeah. I think, I think sometimes leaders, they, they see it as a sign of weakness that they have to acknowledge they've done something wrong. And, and whereas it can be the reverse, it yeah. can build a stronger relationship by acknowledging that because at the end of the day, the person across the table goes, you don't have to apologize. Nine out of 10 bosses wouldn't, but right. you will. Right. What right. else do you need from me? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's super powerful. Um, what about the flip side? So whether it's in business in some of your business stops in the sports entertainment industry or the com competitive side and team performance, what are some of the wins where you've kind of looked back and said, really proud of your team, and, and, and what was the leadership displayed, either by yourself or the team, yeah. to generate that result? Um, man, you know, I've been fortunate now to have been on some championship teams. Um, the first was actually, I mentioned this, this Minnesota Thunder team. Mm. Um, and that was special because um, I had gone there. They were a successful t amateur team, and then we turned pro. Um, and it was, you know, a small group. Uh, the coach was a guy named Buzz Lagos, an amazing, amazing guy. And we set out a goal to win a championship, and we did, right? And so that was really special. And Real Salt Lake, um, we had better teams years after we won the championship, but the year we won the championship, for me, that was a, a coming together of some young people, myself, Garth Lagoway, Jason Christ, John Kimball, like who had ambitions, but we had this great leader in Dave Checkets, um, who was based out of Connecticut. Like he was once a month, Dave would come in and he empowered us to, um, run this team. And I was the president. So, you know, Garth reported up into me and John Kimball and these guys, but we just had like this solidarity, I call it. And Jason Christ was a young leader with the with the locker room that just galvanized the organization and um you know it was it was a that was a special moment too because we we wound up beating the la galaxy with david beckham um in 2009 and it was um we we probably were not the best team and and you know there was probably three or four other teams that were better us than us that year but I also say in 2010, 2011, I think we were the, the better team. We, playoffs are a tricky thing, yeah. you know? And then here in, in 2017, um, and similar to so my Minnesota team, what I forgot to mention, in 1998, we went to the finals and lost. And we made a mission we were going to win it the following year, and we did in 1999. Um, when I was a player, I played for a team called the Brooklyn Italians, and in 1990, we went to the finals of the U.S. Open Cup, lost in the final, came back, won it the next year. And then I did that with Minnesota. And then here in Toronto FC, um, I came at the end of 2015. My first full year was 2016. And you could see that there was some building blocks in place. And, um, you, know, you know, if I had, you know, anything, it was maybe I gave it a little bit of a charge and in 2016, we lost in the final so at home, a game we should have won uh, to Seattle. Mm -hmm. But the next year, like everything, every talking point from myself and Greg Vanny, Tim Bezbachenko, like everyone was, we're going to win the championship. We're going to win MLS Cup. And there was no doubt in our mind that that's where we were going. And we did it. And again, the visualization, the power of visualization, and then the power of alignment. Because the one thing I, I know or a fact you don't win because of one person because of yourself you also don't lose because of one person because of yourself. but you need 
everyone aligned. And my most special moments are when you do get the chance to win and the opportunity to lift a trophy, because as I've learned being in this business long enough, there's so few and far in between. Um, and that's why, like I say, the next MLS cup I left is going to be the sweetest because of the difficult times we've had post last time we were in the MLS cup. It's uh, been really difficult. And then the Argos, like most recently I had such a great experience. We, um, when I, for my first couple of years with the Argos were really difficult and, um, we had a hall of fame GM and, and we had, uh, an NFL, um, head coach, um, but we just had a difficult time meshing the Argos with MLSE as an organization. And, um, I had an opportunity to meet pinball Clemens and, you know, people always forget pinball has such a great football mind. He's such a great football person. Um, but he's a, he's a bridge builder and, you know, he, he wasn't your prototypical general manager. We had to, I paired him with a guy named John Murphy, who is like an encyclopedia when it comes to CFL players. And pinball was fantastic in building that marriage between the two of them and then getting Ryan Dinwiddie in. And you just saw this transformation in the Argos. And then they wanted to be part of MLSE. They wanted to be part of this enterprise that we have. And, you know, the one thing I always say, like pinball, he wants to build bridges. And we built bridges with 50 Bay Street, which is, you know, mm -hmm. all our business units. and. TFC and the Argos are so close right now. We have two Argos interning for us right now at TFC. Um, and so to see this transformation with the Argos was so special. Because you got to remember, I was the soccer guy. Right. That happened he, to work in the NFL for a little bit. You right? had the NFL. But yeah. I was the soccer guy yeah. who all of a sudden takes over the Argos. and In the CFL, let alone not the in NFL. The CFL. Yeah. And I love football. And I, yeah. I, I, I actually love the Argos right now. And I'm so proud of that team. But to see the transformation and to play a small part in that and, and be the leader as club president and to, you know, celebrate with them on the field when they won it was so special and so you know those moments you know especially like we've had a few tough years here at tfc you you appreciate man those moments were good and i don't like to spend a lot of time looking back i i i, mm -hmm. I definitely am a guy that looks forward but i always say this you have to learn from the past and so whenever things are tough for me I, I, I try to say, okay, what did I do in this situation in the past? What did, you know, how did I handle a situation that has come up and it's helped me in my career and situations are different, but over time, you, you, you know, I kind of, you realize, you know, you know, certain cultures, you know, respect for their elders and all these different things. Like, yeah, it's experience. You, you, the experience that I have now, um, you know, I wouldn't trade for anything because I've been through so many twists and turns mm -hmm. and it's prepared me. And, and even the tough times that we're going through with TFC right now, um, I think, like I mentioned, we're, we're kind of on the upswing again and you could feel these little things that come together. And some of it was, okay, how do I fix it? And what have I learned from the past, good and bad? Because sometimes you have to say to yourself, right. I got this, you that, know, that's what this I didn't go to, the way I wanted it to go. That's what I wanted to ask you is how, how do you apply that learning? So yeah. like, how do you keep everybody motivated on the goals when you're going through a difficult period from that experience? Like, so what did you do from winning and then kind of going the other way and now rebuilding yeah. again? What, what was the leadership that style that you had to put in place to keep everybody on board? Yeah. You know, I, and it's weird to say this, but you know, I think Five years from now, I'm going to look back and say my best times as a manager were during the worst times at TFC. And, and in some ways, and I hope I can say that one day, um, it was hard keeping a group of people um, on task. And, and you know, we, we were losing, and it's really hard when you lose as an organization. And there's so many people that, as I mentioned, they're not maybe directly part of the locker room or, or the on-field product, but they do feel part of it and to try to keep them engaged and to keep the group together. And then sometimes when you do make changes, there's a lot of stress and there's fear for jobs and all these different things. 
Um, and how do you bring, bring a group together? And we like, we still have 40 people at TFC who were here in 2019 when we went to MLS mm -hmm. cup. So you still have a lot of people that experience the good times and, um, have also been through difficult times. And what I, you know, talked with everyone about is look, we, we have to change some things because the status quo isn't good enough. Right. And we all have to look in the mirror we all have to challenge ourselves and, you know, one of the things John brought in this kind of above the line mentality, right? Which is something that I'm like, wow, that can resonate across the organization. Um, so I think, you know, history is, is a good teacher. And if you take it for that, and I always try to, I love history, learn from it. And it's not all rosy either. You have to look at too, hey, when things were difficult and whether that's being a parent mm -hmm. or being an executive or being a coach, uh, you have to learn from it, and um, you know not every situation is the same either. And so, what worked in one place may not work in a different place, and you can't be afraid to pivot. Like, I know you have to have a plan, right? And I talked about having having a vision of where you want to go, um, but you know the best laid plans often go awry. And I believe you're judged on how you respond to adversity and how you respond to difficult moments. Um, you know, so a mentor of mine, someone I really, really respect, um, when we were having a tough time, he sent me a note and he said, Muhammad Ali um, was a three-time heavyweight champion, one of the greatest of all time, maybe. And his proudest moments were getting up off the floor. So when Ernie Shavers knocked him down, he got up off the floor and went on to win that fight. And he doesn't talk about winning the championships. He talks about that moment as being his proudest moment. Um, and I'm like, wow. Yeah. Okay. I get it. You know? And so this was someone who I respect kind of like, Hey, yeah, you got knocked down, buddy. You got to get your butt up. Yep. Um, and, and do something about it. And that, that, uh, it's really powerful. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because the, the lessons applicable, you know, the whole reason I started these podcasts were just to share stories like these, right? And I was mentioning it before we started recording today is maybe somebody's listening to this who's going through what you went through 20 years ago and just yeah. needs to learn, oh, okay, that's, that's what's happening yeah. and, and pushes on and learns from the lessons. Um, the lesson you're sharing, it applies in business. You know, I, oh, I grew up in the sales world before I, I got recruited into sports yeah. and entertainment to run the retail business here. Um, and then progressed into the stadium side and stuff. But what I always learned was, you know, when I started in sales, selling at a champ sports bill, like I'd have a bad sales week and I'd be all over myself. And it was like, oh my God, the world's ending, right? And, and, and your boss would be on you about your yeah. sales targets and your keep KPIs. And, and then all of a sudden, as you do that more often, you realize what got you out of it is going back to the core behaviors, maybe changing your process a little mm -hmm. bit, maybe tweaking a behavior. But anchoring down in what you can control yeah. will get you through to that ultimate result. What you're sharing there in sports absolutely applies to anybody listening to this yeah. from a business perspective. My, my so. wife worked at Nordstrom for nine years, and so uh, I know all about the sales oh, numbers yeah. oh, and yeah. uh, that think, whole business. Absolutely. I, I think that's why the sports entertainment hours never phased me much because I had worked in retail yeah. for about oh, 10 years before oh, that. Oh, man. Yeah. There's nothing like Talk it. about hard work. You yeah. work long hours yep. in retail, they and do. it's hard. They do. Um, You've been so gracious with your time. We've just got a couple more questions yeah, to wrap sure. up, so I really appreciate it. Um, first one is, do you follow anybody um, from um, mentoring books, videos, like a leadership influence that you follow to raise your leadership game? Or is it people in the industry that you predominantly learn? Uh, from? You know, I don't follow anyone per se, uh, but there are a few people um, well, hold that have so been you know, there, there, no, there, there, There's yeah. a leadership book Absolutely. for you. I had to plug that. I love so. it. I love it. <laughs> um, so I was fortunate, very young in my career, I mentioned a team called the Minnesota Thunder. I worked yep. for a guy by the name of Bill George. So Bill was the CEO of a company called Medtronic at the time. Mm. He wrote a book called Authentic Leadership. He has since written a few uh, other books. Um when he retired, he retired relatively young from Medtronic and went to Harvard Business School. He's a professor there. He's on LinkedIn a lot. Oh, yeah. and posts a lot. And, I, uh, I think I follow Bill. Bill on is uh, authentic leadership was his first book, and he's had others. And he's, you know, he was amongst the top twenty-five, um, you know, top business people of the century in two thousands and so on. And so he. Um, 
He loved soccer. And our team in Minnesota was owned by a bunch of corporate executives, actually, in town. Bill was the majority owner, and his kids played soccer. He's very knowledgeable about the game. Um, but he would, we would talk once a week by phone. Once a month, we would have lunch together. I would go to his office. We'd sit down. He was running this multi-billion dollar company, Medtronic, and we were a little million dollar operation with the Minnesota Thunder. Um, but he really helped me um, with mentorship. And, and he's the one that taught me to always, that I wanted to be a P&L manager, not a budget manager. So, you know, a budget manager spends to the budget. A P&L manager manages the budget, mm. and if the revenue's not there, you got to cut expenses such that you hit your p It's great, and... and um, that is Bill George, and, and he was uh, um, a visionary and, and a good man um, and someone that over the years I've called on and, and asked for advice. And then uh, when I was in Salt Lake, I met another guy uh, by the name of Chester Elton. So he wrote a book called The Carrot Principle, and he's since written a number of uh, best-selling books, New York Times best-selling books. And his his thing, he's, he's the... Uh, the um, the apostle of appreciation is, uh, yeah. I think, what he goes by, and he he this first book they had, the Carrot Principle, he then took. So he will always have a piece of orange somewhere in his body, and his whether it's a shirt or tie, his glasses and everything. And he wrote a book called The Orange Revolution. And his thing is, it's the Carrot Principle. It's the carrot, not the stick, and to appreciate and. He was actually the one where this all in came to me and this philosophy. And I think I had managed that way, but this, you know, it doesn't matter how good you are as a CEO or a president, but if your people aren't any good and if they're not with you and if they're not all aligned, they're not all in, you know, if they're working four hours a day, you can work 18 hours a day. It doesn't matter. And being all in and getting people that are all in. So Chester Elton um, just a great, great guy, but someone who, great energy also, um, but someone who uh, had, a, had a good influence on me when I was at Real Salt Lake and then how I think about things and, and you know, maybe understanding not everyone is built like you are. And so what's important to other people might not be important to you. And how do you find the commonality? Um, and I call it alignment. How do you align? Because the best sports teams I ever played on, maybe not the most talented players, but the most aligned and the best teams that I've managed are the ones that where everyone's aligned. And so that was, you know, kind of a Chester thing. Mm, awesome. I, I, I do really, you saw me light up when you started to talk about managing a PNL yeah. um, versus a budget. Yeah. And, and, and one of the things I found great leaders do is they have that ability to say, here's a PNL, but what do all the lines mean? And what are the behaviors that line behind the mm -hmm. lay behind the line? Revenue's down. Yeah. Okay, but what? Do, why? And yeah. how do we change that? And yeah. how do I rally a team to put a plan in place to perform the behaviors to think outside the box to get new areas of revenue yeah. or, or or grow the existing revenue stream? And and the great leaders can do that. They yeah. can look at it and go, wait a second, I see that line, and I know what the behavior is and how to fix it. Yeah. And I got an aligned team who will get to that. Versus, hey, you know, revenue's down seventeen percent. Sales team, what's your problem? Yeah. You got to get it up. Or everybody's fired. Well, hold on. There's yeah. some steps before we do that. Yeah. But yeah, at some point you're gonna have to control that PL by controlling an expense. And some is, you know, who you work for as well. So so when I was at Real Salt Lake, Dave Checkets, it was interesting because we weren't hitting our revenue targets. Um, and so I was shaving some expenses and I, I was having a meeting with him and I I was very pleased with the P and L results and he said, Look, Bill. He says, I don't want to save ourselves into anonymity. Mm. And it was such a <laughs> interesting statement because um, I was so focused on selling tickets, but you also are building a brand at the same time. And we had cut a lot of our marketing out. And his, his comment was, we, I don't want to save ourselves to anonymity. So he was willing to actually not hit budget. He was willing to maybe lose more money than he thought he was going to lose, 
to build that brand to where we eventually wanted to go, which, you know, Real Salt Lake, my last three years there, we sold out every single game and we were, you know, one of the top third in, in revenue for the league at that point was sm very small market, but he had that vision of where he wanted to go. And so again, you know, what I always say, we all work for someone unless you run your own business. Um, it's important to kind of understand the mentality of, of your boss as well, because they're tr entrusting you, but then you run with it. Right. And so once I knew that from Dave, I was like, okay, I get it. There's some runway there to still make sure we're marketing properly and we're getting our name out there, but then let's, let's focus on why we're not getting the revenue targets we right. want to get. And, and that was a good learning lesson for me at the time. You've got some guardrails around how to lead yeah, the business, yeah, right? Cause yeah. you've got clarity. It's funny because I look at, um, predecessors to Keith just coming in here now, yeah. but prior to that, having Tim, yep. um, and I didn't get to know Cynthia cause yep. I wasn't here. Um, but knowing Tim and meeting him once around the stadium a couple of times, um, and Richard before, um, they took risks to the PNL oh, yeah. for that long-term brand relevance. Mm -hmm. Like, and people forget, at least when I started in 2004, it was the Air Canada Centre. There was no buildings around that. There was no soccer franchise. There was no football. It was how much can we charge more for a Leaf ticket? Yeah. And Richard was the first one to say, like, the value equation's out of whack. We're going to have to add more quality and service in this equation to drive revenue because people won't pay the same price. Yeah. But they had to spend doing BMO Field. They had to spend buying the franchise. They had to do Maple Leaf Square and... And so it's that ability to like take that short term loss for that long term gain. Yeah, right? uh, so. Tim Lewicki is is an amazing, ama he's I consider him a mentor. Um, you know, idolize <laughs> this is a very strong word, but I do I idolize him. He's a he's a force of nature and his ability to to realize and and have a vision of where he wants to go and how to get there and how to get people to go with him. Um, you know. Uh, he was the one that sent me to Muhammad Ali thing. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so it just shows you like what a, uh, he's a great caring person, but his personality is so strong and oh. he has such a will. Um, man, I, uh, I think he's, he's one of the, I think he's one of the great sports executives. You know, if you make a top five Mount Rushmore yeah. list, you know, he's Tim Lewicki's on it yeah, in I, sports. He's just an amazing guy. And I'll, and I'll say our, our previous CEOs, Michael Friesnell, Cynthia yep, Devine, Michael, I, I forgot, I had yeah. great, great relationships with both of them. Um, different though, you know, yep. uh, different in each of their ways. But the good thing about MLSE is can sit, continue to prosper um, during these multiple leaders. And, and, you know, I think Keith comes in and, you know, we're all looking like, wow, you know, I, he was a Argos team president. So like literally he knows what it's like to be in this seat as mm -hmm. well. Um, which is really cool because um, to have someone with that understanding, I think actually helps us. And then someone that maybe sees things a little differently or has had some different experiences that can help me, help Brendan, help Masai, help, help the other executives at MLSE. It's really exciting. Yeah. He's had quite the path as well. Yeah, and it's interesting. I, did, I didn't get to, I, again, when I was here, Richard was the CEO, but I, as I mentioned, I, I got to meet Tim and to your point, I met him for about 10 minutes and, and Bob Hunter was still here mm -hmm. then. And, and Bob brought me into the suite and I met him right up by the pitch. And he's like, Oh, you know, what did you do here? And I explained, Oh, I was here when it was 20,000 seats yeah. in field turf. Yeah. And he goes, what do you think? I said, wow, you guys have come a great way. This team, we're not even close. And I was like, Whoa. Yeah. Polite. And, yeah. but do you just oh, stand yeah. or yeah. he had a vision and he was yeah. going somewhere yeah. and it didn't surprise me. The teams won under him. Oh yeah. No, it was, uh, you know, he, he, he laid the groundwork. I always say this because Tim and I, Tim was only here for two months when I came. <laughs> um, he laid the groundwork though for me to have the tools as the president of Toronto FC to have this club win. And, you know, I had some good people in place and, you know, he was the one that had the vision to go get the big players, you know, bringing back Josie Altador and Michael Bradley and, um, you know, just, uh, someone that I, I really look up to and I consider a mentor for sure. And he's off doing it with Oakview Group. Oh, Oakview again, Group. Right? It's amazing yeah. how he's built this business. And, you know, one of my special memories was, was I surprised him with a championship ring when we won in oh, 2017. Nice. And it was uh, 
It's a really special moment. So he's uh, uh that's great. He's he's literally when you say the word world class, he's a world class executive. I can only imagine what that ring looks like because I still have some friends around this organization in the middle management. That was ranks. a good ring. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, Ian Malcolm, who's a senior director of food and beverage yep. over at the Air Canada Center. Um, he showed me his ring. Yeah. I was like, wow. And yeah. Glenn Knight over in the retail yep. operations. So good for them. Um, listen, Bill, you've been amazing. Uh, you've given me an hour. I really appreciate the time. Um, any words of wisdom for anybody kind of listening to this? Like, what would you give them as words of wisdom on their leadership journey? Um, you know, I, the one, there's no right way. Like, I want to say there's no right way. I've had some leaders who have been very demanding, very process oriented. Um, and I've had some that have just been, you know, visionaries where just get it done, right? Like, and both equally good, equally great. And I think feeling comfortable with who you are as a person mm. um, and understanding that you can't do it by yourself. It's always about the people and your ability to connect with people and, you know, have the dynamics of bringing a group together. Cause that's, you know, someone, you know, they, they, they told me their the, the epitome of a good leader is if there's a fire and you say, Hey, let's go this way. That's the exit door. And everyone goes the other way. Mm. You know, it's, 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 if you're a, if you're a leader, if you're leading people and there's a fire and you know where the exit is, you want them all to follow you. And, and so they all get out safe. Right. Yep. And, and so, um, that was a, a, an interesting way of looking at things. And, and, you know, for me, I think over time leadership has changed. I think there's certain coaches styles that maybe worked in the sixties and seventies that don't work nowadays. Um, and I do think as a president, as a GM and so on, um, over time you, you have to adapt and adapt to what works for you. Cause I do think there is no correct way you have to adapt work for you. But, you know, sometimes if you stay the same for too long, it eventually gets old or it doesn't work. And so what I try to do is I, I try to learn, like I said, from the past, um, and figure out where I need to fine tune and where I need to get better and what I need to learn, um, such that, you know, 10 years from now I'm leading people, but it's a maybe different people. Um, who have a different view on things. And so, so no correct way. That's, you know, I think there's, there's, it's just finding out what works for you. And, you know, I say the success shows up, whether it's sales results, whether it's championships on the field, that's really where you get judged. And like, one of the things that burns me in sports is like, so I've won uh, four rings, you know, championship rings but I've been a team president for 20 something years. I mean, it's 15, 16 years I've lost. Right. But, and but so, your odds are still pretty good in team in leagues in, with in, that in league, many teams. Yeah, You're not, way above the ratio. You, I know, but there's the year you actually, it's the years it. that you don't win that actually motivate you yeah. even more. Like, like right now going through the, the last two years with TFC, which has been so difficult. I, all I visualize every day is lifting another MLS cup. And being like, okay, you got through that, you know? And like, even with the Argos, when we won, I know how hard the first couple of years were, but I never, there wasn't a day that didn't go by where I didn't visualize how, how are we going to win this great cup with me being the soccer guy who's the president? You know, how am I going to make this work? Yeah. And you realize it's, it's not just you. You need, you need a really good group with you and a good team, you know, um, you know, your coach, your general manager you need the right people. Um, but there is no correct way. I, I'm, I'm convinced of that. And there's a lot of leaders and people who work with people like yourself and Chester and Bill George and so on. You're all different. Um, but you're all teaching great things and teaching leadership, but there is no correct, correct way. Awesome. Appreciate that. All I, right. I do have to tell you like, and leave it with this. I love the fact that, you know, the winning drives you when you're not winning. Mm. Same thing in business, right? You, you have a great year in your business. The PL looks healthy. Well, guess what? On January 1st, it starts all starts over again, all over right? Again. And, and that's going to drive you as a leader. It's the great thing about sports, though, too, is, is 
I had a guy, so when I went to work for the Philadelphia Eagles, the team president at the time was a guy named Joe Banner. And my boss was Mark Donovan, who's just won two Super Bowls in a row with the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, mm. But when I interviewed with Joe, he said to me, he says, look, the easy part's getting to the top. The hardest part's staying there. Mm. And they had gone to three Eastern Conference finals in a row, um, but they hadn't gone to the Super Bowl yet. And we wound up going in 2005 to the Super Bowl. Um, but that stuck with me because... You know, you can get to the top, and how do you stay there? And one of the things I was really proud of with Toronto FC and with Real Salt Lake at the time, uh, back in the day, is is Real Salt Lake. We were six or seven years amongst the top, right? And we won it one year, went to the finals another year. TFC, we had a five year run where we were amongst the best teams in mm -hmm. the league every year. And now it's okay. The easy part should be getting back to the top, but then how do you stay there? So the Argos right now, one of the things we challenge ourselves with every day with the Argos is, okay, we became a good team in 2022, 2021. We won it in 2023, 2022, 2023, we had a historic year. So we're, we're at the top of the mountain and we're staying there, but how do we stay there for another three years? And that's what Pinball and Ryan and the every day – we talk about how do we have sustained success, and that is not easy. Nope. Oof. In sports or business. <laughs> Bill, thank you so much. Thanks, Mark. I really appreciate it awesome. your time. It's like we're sitting at a, at a bar or over a glass of wine hey, just kind of chatting. Maybe we'll do that, that sometime without the camera. Absolutely. Awesome. Thanks, Bill. All right.